iSpace fails to land safely on the moon. China wants to have people on the moon by 2030. And there's another problem with JWST. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. All right, let's just start with a really cool picture that was taken by iSpace's Hakuru R spacecraft when it was about 100 kilometers altitude above the moon. And you can see the Earth rising over the horizon. It sort of harkens back to that really cool Earthrise picture that we saw with Apollo 8. And so we're hoping that this would be a good omen for the upcoming landing of the iSpace mission. Unfortunately, it wasn't. iSpace provided us a live stream of their attempt to put a lander down onto the surface of the moon. Everything seemed nominal. They were moving their way down. But then the communications cut off when the spacecraft was descending at about 30 kilometers per hour. It was about 90 meters above the surface of the moon. Instead of giving us this really cool information and a successful landing, everything just cut off. And we waited and we waited. And we all just started to assume that the spacecraft was lost. And then a few hours later, we got an official announcement from iSpace that they had lost contact with the Hakuru R spacecraft on the moon. At this point, you shouldn't be surprised that a spacecraft had a difficulty landing on the moon. We saw this with Israel's Beresheet lander. We saw this with India's Chandrayaan-2 lander and now Japanese Hakuru R. And actually the Hakuru R and the Beresheet lander shared a common origin, which is that they were both going to be contestants in the Google Lunar X Prize that was going to award like $20 million to the first group that could privately land on the surface of the moon, hop off and travel and then land again. And nobody was able to get close and Google ended up canceling the prize. But two groups, Israel's bear sheet, and iSpace Hakuru R kept going, so they were still going to carry through and land anyway, and I guess bring on commercial contracts. And unfortunately, neither of them made it. So I guess Google made the right call early on. So we're still not entirely sure why the spacecraft failed, but the leading theory right now is that it ran out of fuel. And so it wasn't able to continue on safely, and it just kept accelerating, and then it litho braked onto the surface of the moon. So like we always say that landing on Mars is hard, but landing on the moon is hard. Landing everywhere is hard. Space is tough. This could get complicated and expensive. It's yeah. called rocket science for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Two more companies are going to be making a similar attempt. We've got Astrobotic and Intuitive Machines. They're both contracted with NASA to send some experiments to the moon as well as other private payloads. So at some point, the first commercial company is going to successfully land on the surface of the moon, but it hasn't happened yet. China will have humans on the moon by 2030. So this week was China's Space Day. This is the eighth time that they've celebrated all of their accomplishments in space. And this week, we got a pretty big announcement by the director of China's lunar exploration plans. The director's name is Wu Wairen, and he said that China expects to have humans on the moon by 2030. And this is the first time that we've had a definitive date of when China expects that they're going to have humans on the moon. Of course, this puts them about five years after NASA's return to the moon. And who knows if and when SpaceX will be able to privately send humans to the moon. And there are other people who are planning to go to the moon. But if all of that doesn't come together, China is pretty sure they'll have people on the moon by 2030. Now, they also talked about the next series of missions that are going to be flying to the moon. The next big one is going to be Chang'e 6, which will be another sample return mission, this time bringing back samples from the far side of the moon, Chang'e 7, and then you're going to have Chang'e 8, which will begin the development of a lunar research station on the surface of the moon. China also said that they're looking for international partners to come together for the construction and operations of their lunar station on the moon. But I, I wonder, like, what does that mean? Like, who are acceptable partners for this project? Who are the kinds of countries that can't be a part of it? It, you know, it's kind of sad that we're getting to this point where we're seeing these divisions between our nations when it comes to something as important as having humans on the moon. Like my preference would be that everybody works together to staff a station on the moon, similar to what we had with the International Space Station, despite 
the United States and Russia being not best friends. Um, they were able to work together in constructing the International Space Station. It really was a collaborative effort between nations. And I really think like, the moon should be a collaborative effort between nations, we should have people from every country working together to expand humanity's presence into space, both on the moon and eventually on to Mars. But it looks like it'll probably be two factions, the America, Canada, Europe faction, and then China, Russia, maybe some other nations as well. So we'll see how it all turns out. One other interesting insight that we got from Space Day is that they gave us more details about the upcoming Long March 9 rocket. And this is going to be their super heavy rocket, probably won't launch into the 2030s. But if you look at this rocket, it really looks like a starship. And so their plan is to have a fully reusable two stage rocket heavy lift, almost identical to Starship. One announcement that they've made that's a little different from SpaceX is that they are planning to land the first stage out over the water, probably on some kind of oil platform or barge, something like that, which was an idea that SpaceX was originally considering and then they abandoned it. So maybe it's a good idea after all, or maybe it is a terrible idea and just folks in China just haven't gotten the memo yet. Or maybe SpaceX will change their mind again based on what just happened. Finally, some answers about Starship. So last week, I said that I didn't have any answers. I only had questions. And I was hoping that I would have more answers by now, but I don't. SpaceX themselves have been quite silent about what happened with the Starship launch, what caused the failures of the various rocket engines, why did it fly out of control, what was the damage to both the pad as well as the buildings all around it. How far did they spray debris into the surrounding landscape? Nothing. But we've had some information come in from various people. One big one is the FAA have put an indefinite hold on Starship launches out of Boca Chica. So we're looking at a couple of months at the very earliest, when SpaceX will be cleared for launch again to be able to try another Starship attempt. Elon said a couple of years ago that they weren't going to install a flame diverter underneath the Starship. And instead, they just went with concrete. And based on the depth that Starship was able to gouge out underneath the launch platform, a flame diverter would have been a good idea. It's not going to be easy to do because Boca Chica is at sea level. And so they're going to have to build up to install a flame diverter, some kind of pool to cool down the heat and absorb the noise from the launch. It's a pretty serious undertaking. Elon Musk said they figured they'll have this all wrapped up and ready to launch in about two months. But you know, come on, this is this is Elon time. So you know, my rule is to double and add 10. So you take two months, that turns into four months, you had 10 months, that's 14 months. So 14 months is going to be my estimate when Starship will be ready to fly again. But we'll see. Now I had a really fun conversation with Marcus House and Scott Manley, who are two of the most knowledgeable people about all things SpaceX. And I had a fairly long, interesting conversation with them here on my channel, as well as a follow on questions period just for the patrons. So if you want, you can come and check out the conversation. And if you're clever, you can find a link to the questions as well. One last SpaceX picture. This is a shot of the Falcon Heavy rocket being prepared for launch. And it got hit by a gigantic lightning bolt. And it just shows you uh, what it's like to run spacecraft operations out of Florida, which is known for its lightning storms. It's an amazing picture. I hate ads. And I'm sure you don't like ads either. And I'm really trying to remove every scrap of advertising that I can from everything that we produce. As you know, as you're watching this video, you may notice that there's no ads in the middle of the video, just the ads at the very front, which is like, I, I, I can't remove them. I would if I could. But if you want to help us create the content that we do and sort of move towards this bold future of no ads anywhere ever, you should join our Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash universe today. You can support the work that we do and help us become a truly independent 
Space News Reporting Agency. And in addition to no ads on our videos, you'll also get behind the scenes information, content that's only available to the patrons. I'll also remove all the ads from the Universe Today website for you for life. Even if you stop being a patron, there still will be no ads for you forever. Like that's how much I hate ads. So please come join our Patreon, go to patreon.com slash universe today. Another problem with web. We've been sharing some amazing pictures from JWST every week. And then we also tell you every now and then when there's a problem with JWST and it's time for one of those problems. This doesn't sound like a big one, but still, I just thought you should be aware. NASA is going through a very extensive testing process on JWST. They're going through each one of its 17 observing modes and just making sure that it's working properly, recalibrating it, making sure that everything is in the perfect operation for the astronomers who are going to be requesting time on the space telescope. They found a problem with the mid infrared instrument or MIRI. MIRI has several modes they found in the longest wavelengths, it wasn't receiving as much light as it should be compared to the other modes. Now they haven't taken this offline. They're in the process of diagnosing what the problem is going to be. And hopefully they'll come up with a solution and bring everything back to full operational status. But so if you're planning to book time on JWST and you need the longest wavelengths of Miri, you're not going to get as much of the infrared light as you were hoping to receive. Sorry for the inconvenience. We got a bunch of updates from Mars. First, I just want to start with the cool picture. And this is a picture of Mars moon Deimos seen from the United Arab Emirates Hope spacecraft. And when it took this picture, it was only about 100 kilometers away from Deimos, which is like the closest a spacecraft has been to Deimos in like almost 50 years. And then you've got Mars in the background photobombing the picture. And it's about 20,000 kilometers away from Deimos. And what's really amazing about this picture, according to the scientists, is that they're getting valuable clues about the formation, the origin of Deimos. Like there's two main ideas about where Phobos and Deimos came from. The one idea is that these two kind of potato shaped moons were captured asteroids that they came too close to Mars, they came through some kind of three body interaction and were captured in orbit around Mars. The other theory is that millions of years ago, a large asteroid smashed into Mars, kicked up debris. And these two moons are the results of that impact. And according to the hope mission scientists, the images that they've taken are providing additional evidence towards the theory that they are remnants of Mars itself and not captured asteroids. And I actually had a chance to interview the director of this mission on my channel a couple of months ago. And based on the timing, he had this picture, he knew what they were going to be showing. And yet he was able to keep the secret. So uh, I was surprised to see this really cool picture. I really like the pictures that are coming out of the hope mission. And so if you have the time, go down to the show notes, click on the link, go read the article and look at the other pictures of Deimos. But also look at Mars, look at how cool the surface of Mars looks in this field of view from hope. So congratulations to everybody at UAA for capturing this image of Deimos this close, as well as getting the photobombing Mars in the background. It's a pretty tricky image. I'm sad to report that Perseverance Rover has lost its pet rock. Now this is a rock that was sitting inside one of its wheels and has been there for over 400 days while Perseverance has been rolling around on the surface of Mars. Like how did it get there? We don't exactly know it just appeared one day. But it's believed that say the the rover was going up a slope at a bit of a slant, and some rocks sort of slid in and one stayed inside of its wheel. Another possibility is that it was rolling along flat, crunched over rock, crunched it in half and the rock kind of flipped in to the wheel. And then it's just been holding on to this rock ever since. And then a couple of days ago, NASA engineers were looking at the pictures from the has cam, which is one of the cameras that are looking ahead of the rover to see all the terrain that's in front of it. They were looking at the has cam image and they noticed that this familiar rock that's always there was finally gone. So obviously what happened was Perseverance saw a better rock. It's thrown this rock out because like it doesn't have any pockets. And now it's going to put this better rock into its wheel to keep it going. Ingenuity's 51st flight. This is just your weekly reminder that there is a helicopter 
flying on Mars. And when NASA originally launched the Ingenuity helicopter along with the Perseverance mission, they were expecting to get five flights. Like that was it. They just crossed their 51st flight. And what's amazing is that they went through the Martian winter. This is the time when the dust, when the colder temperatures, the lack of illumination takes out a lot of spacecraft. And controllers were really quite concerned that they were going to lose ingenuity. It was running out of power every night. And then they had to wait until the sun came up, they would sort of fill its batteries again. It was kind of touch and go pardon the pun. But then the seasons changed. We're moving into Martian summer and now it's got plenty of power and it's able to do a lot of flights. And in its latest 51st flight, it was able to capture an image of Perseverance off in the upper left hand corner. And then you can see the shadow of the Ingenuity helicopter just down below in the center of the image. So more flights. And based on the success of Ingenuity and sort of when you consider like what a small package it is, how relatively inexpensive it is compared to the rest of the mission, it's a given that from this point on, there will always be a helicopter flying with every single mission that ever goes to Mars. We know that there's going to be a beefed up version that's going to fly with the Mars sample return mission. It's going to have an arm on it. It's going to be able to fly out, pick up samples off the surface of Mars, fly them back to the sample collection so that they can be sent back home to Earth. And the Chinese have said that they're probably going to be including a helicopter in their future Mars rovers as well. So it really feels like if you don't send helicopters to Mars with every mission, you're just missing out on so much science. No physics breaking UFOs found. The UFO community has been pretty excited that the Pentagon and NASA are starting to take the sightings of unidentified aerial phenomena seriously. There are groups at both NASA and the military investigating the hundreds of sightings that have been seen by pilots, people on the ground, people from people using drones. And so last week, we got a report from the director of this investigation, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick. He gave testimony at the US Senate Committee on Armed Services. He said that they have evaluated 650 different sightings, things that were reported as UAPs. And so far, all of them have been explainable by some natural phenomena. So none of them appear to be extraterrestrial in origin. None of them appear to violate the laws of physics as we understand them. They are balloons, they are drones, they're clutter in the sky, they're other explainable sources. It does seem like a fairly large number of them are aircraft from other nations that maybe are in US airspace. So when we think about the Chinese spy balloon, it sounds like there's a lot more of that kind of thing but nothing violating the laws of physics as we understand it. But their investigations continue and they're still accepting reports from civilians from other military groups, and will continue to evaluate and provide regular reports. But if you're hoping that they were going to find evidence of aliens, uh, keep waiting. All right, those are all the news stories that we had today. Of course, we've got more information in the show notes down below and you can dig down as deep as you want into the rabbit holes. You can get even more space news on my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at university.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Vlad Shipelin, Jay Dennis, David Giltanen, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Andrew Gross, and Josh Schultz who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us. All right, that was all the news that we had today. We'll see you next week.